off. Today we're going to go over the tools needed to build this Phono Stage preamplifier. And I realized that the metalwork is one of the more intimidating things about build, doing these do-it-yourself projects. And on this one, I'm going to really go step-by-step -step in detail of the process of doing all the metal work so that you feel comfortable with it. This is really a good project for beginner metal workers. There's only a few holes that we have to put in the chassis that are you know larger size. Most of them can be done just drilling the holes and the layout's pretty simple. Using the circuit board it makes it really simple to lay out the holes by basically we're just going to be tracing them and I want to show you though the tools that you're going to need to build this project. So I'm going to zoom in on the table so we can start looking at what you're going to need. Okay, the first thing you're going to need is a set of drill bits. And this is the set I have. Um, to me, this is just an investment in a lifetime of do-it-yourself projects. It's got um, a bunch of different sizes. They go up in 64th, 164th increments. And they have these step-down shanks so they fit in a 3 8 chuck. So you don't need a giant drill to get to these larger sizes. And it goes up to a half inch. And real quick, the reason the half inch isn't in here is I put a little tape on the half inch big bit so that I can use this for chamfering the edges of the holes after I drill them. And having this tape on here keeps your fingers from getting cut on these sharp flutes. And so this is just a little tip I do when I'm uh, after I drill a hole to use this bit to clean up the edges of the hole. So, drill bits. Get a set of those. You're going to need a set of Allen wrenches. This is kind of a large set, but it's pretty cheap. It's got metric and American. You can get these at Amazon, hardware stores, etc. This is a kind of a cheap set. I realize that these smaller sizes tend to strip out the Allen bolts. And so, in these smaller sizes that I use a lot, especially this 050, I got these little Weeha brands that I just throw in this kit. Just a little tip, it, in the smaller sizes, you might want to get some higher quality Allen wrenches so you have less problems with it stripping out the heads of the screws. Okay, the next thing you're going to need is a center punch. There's a couple of different kinds. This is an automatic one, and the way these work is you locate the hole, and when you push down, it goes, and it marks the center punch for you and you don't need a hammer okay if you don't have one of these they also make uh, manual ones that you just tap the end of it with a hammer and it doesn't have the spring-loaded thing in it which sometimes is helpful in getting the holes located super accurately sometimes I end up losing this thing and I've just used a nail with the end of it sharpened that'll work too so it's not rocket science here. You just need to put a little dimple right where we're going to be drilling the hole. Another thing that's really handy is having some different kinds of pliers. I use these little jeweler pliers. These have flat jaws. These have round jaws. This little small pair of channel locks is super handy for holding nuts and, you know, doing bending things over that you need so a little, a little pair of these are super handy you can tell these have been around a while but anyway um files these are the three that i end up using most of the time especially this big bit larger size round one and let me measure it real quick for you it looks like it's about three eighths of an inch or nine millimeters so this 9mm 3 8 uh, round file is super handy for squaring off holes where the power sockets are going to go in, for chamfering the edges of the holes that we use with the punch, the chassis punch. And these little flat files are really good for just smoothing up edges. And sometimes this little needle file is helpful. 
I have some of these in different sizes. I got a round one and this little flat one. So a little small assortment of files is handy for doing the metal work. You're probably going to want just some, you know, different sizes of small screwdrivers and then maybe your old number two, number one screwdriver, stuff like that. You may already have some of these, and so they're just handy to have around the house for, I mean, these are great for tightening up your glasses, screws, and stuff anyway, so you may already have some of these, but you're going to need a, a few different sizes of screwdrivers. Probably going to need some metal shears. These are kind of overkill for what we're going to be doing, but these are the ones I have. Um, they don't really, you don't really need these compound ones. You could get away with some that look like just kind of heavy duty scissors because the metal we're going to be cutting isn't very thick. You're going to want just your plain old adjustable wrench. Doesn't have to be anything fancy and I'll show you why we need that next. This is the more specialty tool that we're going to be need to use. And this is a chassis punch. This one's made by Greenlee. And this is a 1 and 3 16 which is what we're going to be using on this project. And the way these work is they have this pull bolt. And go ahead and spend the extra money and get the ones that have these little ball bearing washers. They help keep you from bending up the chassis while you're punching the hole in the chassis. So the way this works is you put the die on. This goes on one side of the metal. And after you drill the hole in the center, then this goes on the other side. And as you tighten this bolt up, it pulls this cutting head into the die and it makes a perfectly round hole. There's really no way to get this quality of a hole without using one of these chassis punches. You can try using a hole saw, but it's probably going to be ugly. I don't recommend doing that. They chatter. They're just a mess, and these aren't that expensive, and they'll last you a lifetime. You can find them used if you need to. I would be careful because some of the used ones are really worn out. The next thing you're going to need is some flush cutting wire snippers. There's all different price points and brands. I'll let you decide. This probably is something I would try to spend a little money on and get some nice ones. The cheap ones, the cutters get dull and all deformed and bend real easy. And the really nice ones have hardened steel cutter tips that stay sharp. And it's one of those things that'll last a really long time. You're gonna need some sort of a drill. It can be a corded drill. I've got this Makita that I've had a long time that I used cordless, but you're going to need some sort of drill to operate your drill bits with. You don't need a drill press. Hand drill's fine. We're not drilling through thick metal, which is where a drill press would be more beneficial. With thin metal like that we're using, there's if it's off axis a little bit, it's really not going to be a problem. Okay, the next thing you're going to need is something to solder with. Here's, here's one little kit. It's a little Velman. It's got a, it's got a knob here. These are about 20 bucks. You can see this thing's seen a lot of use and it's still going strong. It's got a pretty good tip for doing the kind of work we do. It does take a long time to warm up. That's one of the downsides to, to this type. But again, these are only like 20 bucks. So you can get into something like this pretty cheap. There's Pencil soldering irons that don't have this little stand and stuff that will also work, but I like that this has got kind of a heavier stand to hold the iron in, and then the, the cord can go, you know, off somewhere else, and it gives you a little more freedom on your bench. And it's got the knob right here to, to adjust the heat. I did just purchase this little HECO unit, and this one's about $110. It's got an adjustable temperature here and it shows you what the temperature of the iron is. It's got presets so you can have, you know, 700, 750, 800 degrees. And then you, if you know you're going in to solder something that's, 
you know, pretty big or heavy components, you can click the heat up, get the iron good and hot before you go in. One of the things to remember is the hotter the iron is up to a certain point, the quicker you can get in and out with your solder and the less likely you're going to damage the components. I also like the little stand this comes with. It's got a place for you to clean your tip right here. It's got a little well here you can put a little water in to keep the sponge wet to keep the tip clean because, because keeping the tip clean is the key to efficient soldering. If the tip's got any kind of crud on it, the heat's not going to transfer and you're going to end up damaging components by having the iron on the joint too long. So you want to make sure the tip's like super clean, all tinned up before you go in because you want to go in and get out as quickly as possible so you don't overheat components and burn them up. If you get one of the cheaper irons, I recommend getting one of these little things. It's got this gold spongy stuff in here, steel wool like stuff in here for cleaning the iron off so that you can tin it and then get ready to go in and solder. This is another Hacko thing. It's a 599B. I'm sure there's lots of places you can get those. Last, you need some. I use 6040 rosin core solder, 032. This is a, some old stock Radio Shack stuff. There's Plenty of places you can get solder. Just make sure you get a, like a fairly large spool of it. Those little, those small spools are just not economical at all. You want to go ahead and spend enough money to get, I'm not sure, this is an 8 ounce spool. That's about as small a spool of solder as you want to get. The last thing you want to get a few spools of this is some 18 gauge solid core wire. This is what I use for wiring up tube amplifiers. I know people say you can use smaller stuff, but I like the 18 gauge because it holds its shape. And I'm not sure how much of this we're going to be using in this amplifier, but I know there's a couple of places that we have to add some wire. So you want to get a, a couple of colors, at least a couple of colors of this type of wire. And then finally you want to get some, this is 20 gauge stranded and this is a lot more flexible kind of stuff this is good for like signal wire and that sort of thing and this brand has a nice little velcro thing that holds them in place and they come in a box of about five different colors it looks kind of like it looks like this so it's not real expensive so get a get a box of like 20 gauge stranded and then get 18 gauge solid and this is a tool that I can't stress highly enough how important this is to doing a really good job with metalwork. And it's a vernier caliper. I would definitely invest a little money in a nice one of these. Don't try to get by with a plastic one. Don't get one of those little cheap metal ones. Get a nice stainless steel one. Try to find one that looks like this. There's, you know, some off-brands. This is a Central Tools. It's a really nice one. Starrett makes a really nice one. I mean, you probably don't need to spend $150 or $200 on one. I would rather see you go buy a used one than buy a cheap one. And you don't need one with a dial. You don't need one with, like, digital readouts and stuff on it. Just get one of these plain ones here. Make sure it has this little lock on it so it can hold the settings. The cheap ones don't hold the settings good. That's a problem. But then it, it's great for like transferring measurements from here to there. You can mark stuff off and we're going to be using this a lot. So make sure you get a nice one of these. These measure down to a thousandth of an inch. So again, it's called a vernier caliper. Pick one of these up. That's mandatory. The last thing you're going to need is a voltmeter. I have this, it's not super high end, but it's a fairly nice fluke meter. You don't need one this nice, for, especially for this project. You do want to make sure that the voltage is up high enough. You want at least 600 volts. This one's safed up to 1,000. But 600 volts should be plenty for almost any tube stuff you're going to be doing. And 
I think that's really it for all that we need to build this amplifier. Well, I hope from this you can see there's not a whole lot of real specialty tools needed for this. The main one are these chassis punches. And again, for this project, we only need this one punch. Again, you can find these new on Amazon or other tool supply places. You can get used ones on uh, eBay or some other auction sites. So not a huge cash outlay there. A lot of these other tools are things that you would, may have already, like a cordless drill and some of these you know, wrenches and screwdrivers and stuff. So hopefully that you'll be able to put together a toolkit that'll get you on your way to doing the metal fab work to build this project. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you like the channel, please subscribe, like the video, and we'll see you soon for more preamplifier fun. Have a great day.